Good evening. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party, HDP's presidential candidate, Selahattin Demirtas, appealed to the Ankara 19th High Criminal Court on Tuesday, demanding his release. Selahattin Demirtas, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, HDP, has appealed through his lawyers for his release from jail on Tuesday, stating that his official candidacy constitutionally necessitates active participation in the election period. Demirtaş's lawyers appealed to the Ankara 19th High Criminal Court on Tuesday demanding his release, stating that Turkey's constitution and European Court of Human Rights ECHR, legislation stipulates the right to a free election. Our appeal for release today is not a particular demand for Demirtaş's individual freedom. This demand is the demand of millions of voters who support him. These millions want Demirtaş to be in the field with them, living the election period with them, lawyer Mahsuni Karaman said on Tuesday in front of the Ankara court. Demirtaş was arrested in November 2016 and has been in prison ever since on numerous charges, including leading a terrorist organization. The first hearing of the case was held in December 2017 and he has appeared in the court three times. Demirtaş was presented as the HDP's presidential candidate for the upcoming SNAP elections scheduled for June 24th, and the Supreme Board of Elections officially approved his candidacy with an announcement on Sunday. Demirtaş releases election manifesto at a meeting in Ankara on Monday. We are the voice not of monism, but of pluralism. We say we are here against a regime that declares everyone not on its side criminal and works for its own existence alone. We are at the turning point of ending a 16-year-old destruction at the ballot box, Demirtaş said in the opening of his election manifesto. Demirtaş's manifesto includes the following promises. The state of emergency will be ended as soon as possible. Compensations will be given for the damage caused by the state of emergency and decrease. The presidential palace in Ankara will be emptied and allocated for public use. The structure of the higher council of judges and prosecutors will be rearranged and the Minister of Justice will be removed from the Council. The Council of Higher Education will be abolished, and the academic, scientific and administrative autonomy of the universities will be restored. Obstacles against the people's right to information, freedom of thought, expression, demonstration and organization will be eliminated. The Kurdish question will be solved within a perspective which contends that a permanent peace is the only way to ensure welfare and tranquility for the peoples of Turkey. Joining us via Skype tonight to talk about HDP's presidential election campaign is Hishyar Ösoy, who is a member of the Turkish parliament with the People's Democratic Party, HDP. Good evening, Mr. Ösoy. Welcome once again to This Week in Turkey. Good evening. Thank you. So your party's presidential candidate, Selahattin Demirtas, is currently in jail. How does your party plan to carry out his election campaign? Uh, it's going to be difficult, uh, to be honest, uh, because all the other, all other candidates, they are not carrying out their campaigns. They are on the streets. They are having meetings with people. But Mr. Satin Demirtas is still in prison. Uh, and uh, one crucial issue is the fact that the European Court of Human Rights also has not made any decision about his situation. Uh, it is it is it is a uh, challenging situation, but at the same time we have millions of people who are outside and who are supporting uh, uh, our candidate, Mr. Salatin Demirtas, and mostly it will be the people who will be carrying out the campaign. And of course, as a party, we have uh, we have um, managed to create a specific uh, commission to support uh, Mr. Demirtas. Uh, uh, when he's running his electoral campaign. So one of the uh, major problems faced by your party for the upcoming parliamentary elections seems to be the 10% election threshold. Does your party have any concerns or hesitations about meeting this 10% um, threshold? Uh, no, we don't. We don't. Uh, but well, our only concern, we know that more than 10% of the votes will go into those ballot boxes. We are pretty much sure about that, but we are not sure about how many votes will come out of those ballot boxes because there are all kinds of uh, irregularities and fraud, and the government uh, uh, recently uh, passed a specific legislation 
to control the ballot boxes. And uh, they also legalized uh, so many irregularities. That is our pri uh, primary concern. Uh, if uh, if there is there are fair elections, definitely we are going to pass that 10 percent threshold, despite uh, thousands of arrests and daily detentions, despite all these pressures and the governments using state resources, the governments almost complete monopoly over the media. Uh, uh, despite all these uh, um, pressures and disadvantages, we can pass that 10 percent threshold. But uh, there may be more direct interventions into the ballot boxes when both voting and counting the votes. Uh, and that is our primary concern. Mm -hmm. And um, is your party taking? Is your party actively taking steps steps at the moment uh, in terms of uh, making sure that the elections take place in a fair and secure environment? Obviously, I'm um, talking about ballot box volunteers and the like here? Yeah, I mean, we are definitely, we are doing those. Uh, there will be a lot of observers uh, who will be there on behalf of the HDP, our party. There will be also many international observers, both formal from the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, as well as the OSCE. And there will be many other informal uh, observers of the ground uh, to put a pressure on the government so that the government wouldn't make many, many irregularities. Definitely there will be irregularities. It's impossible to stop all of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are having these elections under emergency rule conditions. That is an emergency rule in the country. And, uh, and the legislation that recently passed uh, uh, gave uh, both the police and the chairs of ballot boxes uh, new powers, new authorities. Uh, so we will try our, but it will be quite difficult in Kurdish provinces, particularly in the rural areas of Kurdish and cities. Despite this, we, uh, we are we are preparing for almost anything, but we know that it won't be possible to protect all the ballot boxes uh, based on our experiences particularly in November 2015 general election, but as during the random last year. So now let's talk a bit about the hypothetical scenarios about uh, the presidential election. So if the second round of the presidential elections happens and uh, your candidate, Demir Tash, isn't one of the remaining candidates, would your party declare support for the candidate, for whoever remains, to oppose Erdogan? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You posed this question in a very nice way. It's very nicely worded. I am saying this because oftentimes people ask us, say, what will be your choice in the second round, uh, thinking that Mr. Salatin Demirtas would not have any chance. Okay, and you are saying if Mr. Demirtas uh, is not second round, thank you for that if, uh, because it's not clear we are still a part of the race. Uh, but uh, well, when they ask us now this, who are going to vote in the second round, we say it's Demir Tashi himself, as we said. So we are still a part of the second round. But if it does not happen, if Mr. Demir Tash is not in the second round, then we need to reevaluate the whole process. So it is not that it's not that the HDP is going to vote for the person against Erdogan. It's not that simple. We, we need to see uh, what they are going to promise to the peoples of third. We need to see their political vision, their project. So it's not a done deal for now. Mm -hmm. So your party's co-chair, Parvin Buldan, said this week, and I quote, no Kurd will vote for Mrs. Akshenar if she remains uh, for the second round of the elections, assuming that the second round will happen. Is this really so, and do you share the same view? Uh, I wouldn't vote for Ms. Meral Akshanet, uh, definitely. I share the feeling, and I also feel that many, many Kurds uh, uh, will not be voting for her, because Meral Akshanet, I mean, people, uh, people have memories. They remember things. 
Maralachener was the Minister of Interior in the 90s when so many uh, Kurdish people were killed uh, on the streets, I mean, under torture. And uh, she kept saying, repeatedly saying that it's part of uh, her past, particularly during the 90s. It's said she doesn't regret anything she had done in the past. And so uh, if my feeling is very strong to think that people are voting for it. Yes, the Kurdish people are very, very at, angry at President Erdogan, particularly uh, because of the trust he has committed over the past two years. But uh, this is not um, enough for people, for Kurdish people, to go and vote for Ms. Akshaner. And um, finally, what about CHP's candidate, Muharrem Ince? If he was uh, a candidate in the second round of the presidential elections, what would your party, HDP's stance be? As I said, I mean, we have to see what he's going to do, what, what he's going to say. We know that the CHP is kind of trying to, uh, to win the popular support of the citizens, for example, uh, uh, Mr. Inge, he personally visited Mr. Demirtaş in prison. It is a symbolic gesture. It is a nice symbolic gesture, I should say. But uh, it is not enough. He also had one of his meetings in Hakkari, a Kurdish town in both Iraq and uh, Iran. Uh, so that was also a nice symbolic gesture, but I do think that Kurdish people uh, both uh, um, they deserve, and also they depend and expect Mr. Inje to say something concrete that would address their grievances, their demands. Uh, until now, the presidential campaign, mostly, mostly, mostly the presidential campaign um, has been uh, 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 carried out uh, at this symbolic, polemical level. So. Uh, Mr. Inja also likes polemics, I mean, which is good for any politician, of course. I mean, involving in polemics in a you know successful way, it is good. But all people are waiting for him to somehow leave aside that polemic tone, that polemics with President Erdogan, but push forward his political agenda, his political vision. We are expecting him what he really thinks about, for example, the question of proof of law, of the democracy, of the Kurdish question, which is very, very crucial for the HDP, of course. Uh, and w what is his project uh, to overcome this economic crisis? What is his project about the presidential system, the parliamentary system? He thinks of decentralization and local governments, for example. More than 100 Kurdish municipalities uh, have been seized. and. Uh, uh, so far, unfortunately, the CHP as a political party has not been vocal about most of the issues, problems that the Kurdish people have. So now we are expecting Mr. India to say something clear, neat, to point about these problems that we are having. I mean, if he's successful, if he has a successful kind of uh, campaign, a convincing one, as I said, we are going to consider, of course, we are going to give a real uh, the candidates of the second round. But as I said, nobody should think that the HDP is going to vote for some candidate simply because he is a guest of Erdogan. But not the case. Ishar Özsoy, thank you very much for your comments and for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a good one. We'll continue with our next news video now. Turkey will hold both presidential and parliamentary elections on June 24th, with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan looking to assume sweeping new executive powers that will come into force after the polls. People's Democratic Party HDP's former leader Selahattin Demirtas is one of the challengers in the presidential race, but is fighting his campaign from a cell in a top security prison while being tried on terrorism charges. Opposition parties have failed to agree on a joint candidate to face Erdogan, but if the president fails to win an absolute majority on June 24th, they could unite behind a single candidate in runoff polls two weeks later. 
In the first round, we will come together around Selahattin Demirtaş. He is a politician loved in Turkey. He is a politician who raises trust and hope in society. We do not talk about the second round at the moment. We do not discuss it, said HDP party co-chair Pervin Buldan. Everybody is making some calculations, but they know this very well. There will be no solution without the Kurds and the HDP. We are the key party in this election. Of course, we will need to make a choice between the two candidates who will compete in the second round. But we do not discuss this right now, she added. Nevertheless, in a later interview, Buldan said that no Kurds would vote for Meral Akşener's good party. I wish with an open heart to express today that no Kurd will vote for Mrs. Akşener, most of all myself, she said. Akşener's good party had vetoed the HDP, joining the nation alliance of parties in opposition to the government coalition, Buldan said. And in return, no Kurds would support her, even if she was left head-to-head with Erdogan in the second round of the presidential election. In response to that, Akşener said, The claim that Kurds will not vote for me in the second round of the presidential election is a complete urban legend, emphasizing that she had established a close relationship with Kurdish voters. With 11 of its members of parliament and thousands of its activists jailed in a wide-ranging government crackdown on dissent, the HDP runs the risk of failing to match its performance in the 2015 parliamentary elections, when it became the first pro-Kurdish party to exceed the 10% election threshold. A parliament without HDP will be a huge shame for Turkey. The HDP is the only party that supports human rights, freedoms and peace, said Buldan. We have never gone below 10% in polls. Even if we are above 10%, we will work as if we are not. We will protect both the votes and the ballot boxes. I believe that society in Turkey will solve the problem of the election threshold for the HDP. If the HDP fails to pass the 10% threshold, many of the seats in the mainly Kurdish Southeast will likely go to the ruling Justice and Development Party, AKP, which traditionally comes second place in the region. No one should ignore the fact that 70 to 80 deputies will be won by the AKP if HDP votes remain under 10%, Buldan added. The Turkish lira slid to a record low this week after President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said he plans to take greater control of the economy after the elections next month. Less than 45 days to the presidential and parliamentary elections in Turkey, the Turkish lira is sliding, while Turkey's recent economic figures are under question. Since the beginning of the year, the depreciation in the Turkish lira relative to the US dollar has reached 17%, while the bond market interest rate is valued at 16%, and the inflation rate for April was announced as 11%. Meanwhile, credit rating agency Moody's warned Turkey for the overheating of the economy and announced that the outlook for the Turkish banking system is negative. President Erdogan, who paid a three-day visit to London, told Bloomberg TV in London that after the vote transforms Turkey into a full presidential system, he expects the central bank will have to heed his calls for lower interest rates. When the people fall into difficulties because of monetary policies, who are they going to hold accountable? They'll hold the president accountable. Since they'll ask the president about it, we have to give off the image of a president who is influential on monetary policies, Erdogan said. After Erdogan's statements, the Turkish lira plumbed a new record low against the US dollar, reaching 4.49 lira, while the country's dollar-denominated 10-year yield rose more than 40 basis points to 7.08%. Reuters reported that Erdogan's comments deepened investors' worries about the central bank's ability to fight inflation and financial instability. Yet, the Central Bank of the Republic of Turkey announced that it is closely monitoring the unhealthy price formations in the markets and had a meeting with President Erdogan at the AKP headquarters. Deputy Prime Minister Mehmet Şimşek also tweeted that emphasizing a rule-based market economy is the only viable option going forward. Meanwhile, Turkey's recent economic situation also triggered a new debate in the presidential election campaign. Good party leader Meral Akşener criticized the ruling AKP's economic stewardship. Mr. Erdogan's recent speech that he delivered abroad has revealed the Turkish economy's loneliness, showing the world that Turkey is forced to adopt an understanding that is detached from basic economic reality, Akşener said. According to a report by the German media, a German-made spy software called FinSpy was used to spy on the phones of the attendees of last year's CHP-led Justice March. German daily Süddeutsche Zeitung and public broadcasters NDR and WDR published a report by the digital rights group Access Now, which said that a software called FinSpy, created by German company FinFisher, was used to spy on the phones of the attendees of last year's CHP-led Justice March. 
The report said the attendees downloaded the program via a link shared by fake Twitter accounts, allowing real-time access to the contacts, photos, and videos on their smartphones. But the German economy ministry said that it had strict rules regarding the export of spy software licenses and had not approved any licenses for them since October 2014. Germany has strict rules for exporting spy software and has in the past vowed to block exports to some countries. Meanwhile, main opposition Republican People's Party CHP leader Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu has called on German and Turkish authorities to reveal the details. This program cannot be sold without the authorization of the German government. We want to know who the German government sold this program to in Turkey, Kılıçdaroğlu said. On the other hand, Turkish communications minister Ahmet Arslan has dismissed the allegations. We, as the ministry, have not bought such software. It is out of question, Arslan said. He also noted that the Information and Communication Technologies Authority is in charge of legal wiretapping and the authority takes such actions only with permission from courts and judges. Kılıçdaroğlu has led thousands on his three-week justice march to Istanbul from the capital Ankara last year to protest the imprisonment of a CHP lawmaker, Enis Berberoğlu. President Erdogan and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu entered a Twitter spat over the violence at the Gaza border this week. Israelis and Americans celebrated the opening of a new U.S. embassy in Jerusalem on Monday. At the same time, less than 75 kilometers away, at least 62 Palestinians were killed and 2,700 others were injured by Israeli fire targeting the mass protests at the Gaza border. The attack was reported to be the deadliest since Israel's 2014 cross-border operation in Gaza. In response to the U.S. embassy move and Israeli attack at the protesters, Turkey recalled its ambassadors from Tel Aviv and Washington and called for an emergency meeting of Islamic nations scheduled for today. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu were involved in an ongoing tit-for-tat dispute on Twitter, accusing each other of brutality and human rights abuses. Israel is wreaking state terror. Israel is a terror state, Erdogan said in a speech for state television on Monday. What Israel has done is a genocide. I condemn this humanitarian drama, the genocide, from whichever side it comes, Israel or America. In response, Netanyahu tweeted, Erdogan is among Hamas's biggest supporters and there is no doubt that he well understands terrorism and slaughter. I suggest that he does not preach morality to us. Erdogan shot back at Netanyahu's tweet, writing, Netanyahu is the prime minister of an apartheid state that has occupied a defenseless people's lands for more than 60 years in violation of UN resolutions. He has the blood of Palestinians on his hands and can cover up crimes by attacking Turkey. Want a lesson in humanity? Read the Ten Commandments, Erdogan added. Our support to the resistance of the Palestinians upsets them. But in this context, I do not deem Hamas a terrorist organization. Hamas is one of the resistance movements working to liberate the occupied territories of the Palestinians, Erdogan further added during an official visit to London on May 16th. My reply to Netanyahu's tweets must have got on their nerves, he added. President Erdogan declared three days of mourning on Monday and announced a mass rally to be held today after Friday prayer in the Yenikapu district of Istanbul to show solidarity with the Palestinians. Former Halkbank executive Mehmet Hakan Atilla was sentenced to 32 months in prison after he was found guilty by a U.S. court for taking part in a scheme to help Iran evade U.S. sanctions. State-owned Halkbank executive Mehmet Hakan Atilla was sentenced to 32 months in prison on Wednesday after he was convicted earlier this year of taking part in a scheme to help Iran evade U.S. sanctions. The case has strained diplomatic relations between the United States and Turkey, and President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has condemned it as a political attack on his government. Prosecutors said the central figure in the sanctions dodging scheme was wealthy Turkish Iranian gold trader Reza Zarrab, who pleaded guilty to fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering charges, and testified for several days as the US government's star witness against Attila. Victor Rocco, one of Attila's lawyers, said his client would appeal this conviction, but called the sentence fair. Attila, who worked as a deputy general manager at Halkbank, has already spent 14 months in jail. That time will count toward his sentence and he could be freed early for good behavior. Judge Richard Berman said that Attila appears to have led an exemplary life in Turkey, pointing to more than a hundred letters he received from Attila's family and friends in his support. Meanwhile, Rakko agreed that leniency was justified. What we need to show the world in proceedings such as this, especially today, especially now, 
is that we Americans aren't bullies, he said. Kathy Fleming, another of Attila's lawyers, read a brief statement by Attila, translated from Turkish, asking for Berman's understanding of the situation that he and his family are in. Apart from my family, I have no other priorities, the statement said. Now let's take a look at what's on in Istanbul next week. Raul Midden, the American singer, songwriter and guitarist, who is a native of New Mexico, will be at the Aya Irini Church of the Topkapı Palace tomorrow. His unique musical style is influenced by soul, jazz, folk, blues, R&B, flamenco and bossa nova, while his songs are marked by his extraordinary vocal skills. Midden has also collaborated with musicians from a variety of backgrounds, including Herbie Hancock and Snoop Dogg. The Harry Potter concert series returns to Zorla Performing Arts Center with Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets in concert, the second film in the Harry Potter series. On Saturday and Sunday, the Istanbul Orchestra will perform John Williams's unforgettable score for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, while the film will be screened in high definition on a 40-foot screen. Curated by Zafer Toprak, Istanbul's seaside leisure exhibition is on until the 26th of August at the Para Museum. It brings together photographs, magazines, comics, objects, and books from various private and institutional collections, and tells a nostalgic story while also addressing the change and socialization of the norms of how Istanbulites use their free time. Istanbul Seaside Leisure is a documentary testament of the radical transformations in the Republic's lifestyle. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again next Friday at 9 p.m. Goodbye.